The open road leads to many paths, but also bears witness to countless horrors. Such is the case for truckers, who have seen more than their fair share. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. As a man that has reached the ripe old age of 48, I can promise you I have seen some shit go down. This one totally takes the cake for me though. I was waiting out front of a truck stop back in the mid 80s, sitting on a park bench with a guy that had a big Rottweiler kind of dog on a leash with him. I tried to make small talk, but he was quite a sourpuss. So we sat there in silence for a few minutes, until the most unexpected thing I had ever seen happened right before my eyes. Whilst we were sitting there, a big 18 wheeler pulls in without a trailer. So he parks right up front like a normal car would. Inside the cab of the truck, with the driver, is a little monkey. The dance for the organ grinder kind. I think they're called Reese's monkeys, perhaps. Well, the dog spots this little monkey and proceeds to go apeshit over it, lunging at the end of his leash and barking at the top of his lungs, generally making a real spectacle of himself to say the least. The driver is obviously upset, but not nearly as much as the monkey is. Actually, upset may be the wrong adjective to use for the monkey though, in retrospect. I think eagerly aggressive may be a more appropriate description for his disposition. He was pacing the dashboard back and forth, never taking his eyes off this very aggravating dog. The driver opens his little triangle window that they don't make on cars anymore, the ones made for smokers back in the day. He yells out to the douchebag to call his dog off because it's upsetting his monkey. The guy laughs and says no way, and proceeds to say that the dog isn't bothering anyone. The dog hasn't shut up since he laid eyes on the monkey, and I promise you he is bothering everyone for several blocks around. Now, here's where things start to get interesting. The driver says that if he doesn't call off his dog, he's gonna let the monkey loose on the dog. The douchebag laughs, and says that his dog would eat the monkey alive. Upon hearing this, the driver leans over and reaches into his glove box, pulls out one of those tiny baseball bats, like you used to get at Astro World or in carnivals, and places it in the monkey's hand. The monkey obviously knows what is about to go down, because he is now trying to squeeze out of that little triangular window as I mentioned earlier. This monkey has murder in his eyes if I've ever seen it. The driver hollers, last chance to save your dog's ass man. In response, douchebag lets his dog off the leash. Now we have a situation that has escalated to the point where we have a dog jumping up at a window and a monkey screaming profanities right back at him. While the driver finally rolls down the regular window and out leaps all kinds of miniature primate hell. The dog never knew what hit him. Quick as a flash, this monkey is riding on the back of the dog's neck. His two back feet are all wrapped up around the neck fur, with one hand around the near. The other hand, as you may have guessed, is now steadily and mercilessly raining down blows on this dog's head and face. And I mean hard blows. You can really hear them. Well, it only took a moment for the dog to realise that it was way in over its head. He bolts, yelping bloody murder as he runs away full speed. I mean this dog is running so hard that he's throwing up tufts of grass and dirt as soon as he leaves the pavement. The monkey's still riding him and beating him the whole time. Douchebag acts like he wants a fight now, but several people including myself step in to stop that nonsense. In a couple of minutes or so, the little monkey comes looping back, with his little bat still in hand, and leaps up to the open window of the truck, to await his master who has gone into the store. 
the douchebag ran off to try and find his dog, but I don't know if he ever did. My riot showed up, and I had to go. Nevertheless, never again in this lifetime will I see something so totally crazy and unexpected like that. I am both fortunate and humbled to have been privileged to be present for such an event. This happened to my father. A few years ago, he was driving a road train here in Queensland, Australia. It was him and three other road trains, I think, and he was second in line. For anyone wondering what a road train is, imagine an old looking, generally all around gigantuan sized semi truck hauling three, sometimes four, normal sized trailers at the same time. Yeah, hauling that much stuff of course, is not going to be able to stop as fast as your 1994 Honda Civic. Anyway, some guy tried to overtake all of them before the overtaking lane ended. This lane isn't very long, about one kilometer, and they are few and far between along this road, which the guy obviously knew. Now, this guy had ran out of room by the time he had gotten to the truck at the front. And so, he went off the road and rolled his car. The trucks all stopped, and my father got out and ran towards the car, which was by now on fire. The first driver was much closer to the car than my father was, due to these trucks being a good hundred meters long. When dad got there, the truck driver just had his hands in the air, saying, nope, I can't handle this. What he had seen was the man, still conscious, flailing about in the car burning alive. Dad didn't want to see something so horrid, so he didn't look, but he is still haunted by the fact that a man was alive only one minute ago driving past him, but then, one minute later, he was burning alive in a car ahead. The truck driver is basically a basket case today. He still can't get over it and feels terrible, but it is by no means his fault. Driving back from a road trip, someone tried overtaking my father again on the same stretch of road, not two kilometers away from the night before. There were police up ahead, and the guy was up to about 200 kilometers an hour just to get ahead of my dad before the lane ended. So he slams on the brakes just before he can get seen by the coppers. And dad says he barely braked in time to not send him flying ahead due to the road trains having a much harder time braking than any car does. They get pulled over and my dad abused the hell out of this guy because he was still upset about the night before and he sure as hell didn't want to see that shit again. And the guy acted like he had no idea what he did. I have never seen my dad afraid but I could see in his eyes just how scared he was when he told me this, because that moment terrified him so much that he could have been the guy to take another man's life so quickly. I hope you people can understand that trucks, especially road trains, do not have the same capabilities as cars, and you should know how to act around them, and know how they work. I used to drive I-80 between San Francisco and Cheyenne, Wyoming, a lot. It is about 16 to 20 hours of driving, depending on weather and traffic and whatever. Anyway, I was driving at night and the car starts making this odd grinding noise, as if I ran over something that got stuck. It's about 2am, I pull into a rest stop that's well lit and wake up my buddy who was sleeping. I explained to him, as we both get out the car, that I heard what sounded like a kid crying. There are no other cars at the rest stop on this windless night, but we frequently heard stories about child trafficking and kidnapping nearby. So we decided to check it out. We grab our flashlights and head towards the noise, which is coming from the bathrooms. 
As we get closer, we realise it's coming from the women's bathroom. It's a low, dull sobbing. We walk in, expecting to see some brutally beaten and or raped eight-year-old or something. And we see... nothing. The sound is still there. It's clearly coming from the room. But the room is empty. We turn on the lights. Still nothing. Check each stall. The trash can everything. We start looking for everywhere in the room. But it's coming from... nothing. Is it a hidden speaker? Are we on candid camera? What the hell? My buddy climbs up on one of the stalls to get to the top window in the rest stop which is vented out and open. He closes it and the noise stops completely. He opens it again and there's no more noise. We sit there for a few seconds, staring at each other. He shrugs. The window then slams shut again without him touching it. We were out of that bathroom in seconds. The noise started up about 10 seconds after, just as we were getting to the car. And we were tearing out of the parking lot within 10 seconds. The grinding noise was still there. So at the time, I pull over a few miles later at a Flying J truck stop, well lit and sometimes occupied. Couple of truckers there, no other civilians like us. We check under the car. There's a red and silver piece of metal wedged between the part of the car and the road, about half an inch off the ground or so. So with us in the car, it would have definitely been grinding against the ground. I can't remove it by hand, it's really wedged in there. So we kick at it to bend it and figure that we'll remove it when we get back. A week later, I had my mechanic take a look at it when he was doing a service. It was part of a kid's tricycle. <laughs> I've seen plenty of stuff out there in the interstate. My first couple of years, I was a night driver, so it was hard to see things sometimes. But the one time in Pennsylvania was me trying to follow a fellow flatbedder who was hauling serious ass through the mountains. At one point, I start to fall back because I can feel the van starting to lean. It wasn't long after that that I reach down to take a swig of the handy monster I had. And I look up, and there's a guy standing off the shoulder, just outside the tree line, wearing what appeared to be some type of soldier uniform. He looked like he was from the revolutionary slash war era. He had a musket as well. As I approached him, I could see him staring right at me. And then he starts walking back into the tree line, still looking at me. Before he manages to make it through the trees, he disappears. Like, literally vanishes in thin air. I had my windows down, and the air in the area got really cold. And after about a mile, it seemed to warm up again. I had a really sad feeling come over me for a while afterwards. Needless to say... I didn't stop for the rest of my shift. New Mexico, Nevada and Utah are some of the states that to this day, I still see shit in the skies that I can't explain. Lights rapidly changing directions and taking off at blinding speeds, but no sound barrier being broken. I've seen lights hovering over the desert several miles off the interstate, and then it suddenly takes off or just cuts out. Various shapes and sizes from what I can make out. I know military aircrafts pretty well, and some of them more than likely were, but some of them absolutely could not be military aircrafts currently in mainstream use. Conventional aircrafts don't move like that. The most vivid one would be at an off ramp in New Mexico. I stopped to take a whiz and decided to turn around to give it a 15 minute break since my ass was sore anyway. 
As I'm stargazing and admiring how clear the sky is, I saw what looked like a formation of lights in the shape of a triangle, lift off the desert floor, and then take off into the sky. I kept my eyes on it, and it just kept gaining altitude until the lights just disappeared. I looked down at my watch, and noticed that it wasn't ticking, so I pulled my phone out, and it's off. I turned my phone on, and according to the time on my phone, it had been 5 minutes since my watch stopped. I felt like whatever it was that just took off, had something to do with it. Kent, Texas is another one. There's an old Chevron station, and it seems like FedEx drivers like stopping in there in droves. I'm guessing it's a popular drop and hook point for them or something. But I stop one day, and I need to take a whiz. I don't know why, I didn't just stop in Van Horn. So I pull off, and I roll into the empty lot across the street. Kent is an abandoned town. I walk up to the bush line, and noticed a makeshift fire pit. The wood is somewhat burnt, but not all the way. The weird thing is that there is an unscathed dollar bill stuck in the wood. For a second I was like, ooh, piece of candy. But then, I got this sudden feeling of nope. So I left it alone and went to the toilet. As I'm walking back, I look over and get a very negative feeling. I look to the ground in front of me, and bam, there's a rattlesnake looking right at me. I stopped dead in my tracks, and walked carefully around it, and it seems to be staring at me. I run as fast as I can, back to my truck feeling like somebody was behind me. I kicked up a lot of dust getting out of there, and I have never stopped in Kent since. This other time in Missouri, I stopped at an off-ramp to stretch and take a breather. As I was smoking a cigarette, a little girl from some direction I couldn't figure out giggles, and says, Hi mister. My initial reaction was a bit creeped out. What is a kid doing out here in the middle of the night? So I talk back and say hi. Then she responds with, My mummy says you'll be okay. Don't worry. Now utterly confused, I ask her what she means. No response. Then suddenly, I feel like somebody is standing next to me. But it doesn't feel negative or bad. It just feels like somebody is right there next to me. Since it didn't have a negative vibe to it, I just finished my cigarette and left. Later on down the road, I realised that I forgot to fuel up at my last stop, when the warning light came on. So I scramble to look at my GPS to find the nearest truck stop, and I find one and set the course. As I roll up to the truck stop, my truck starts spluttering, and I barely make it to the fuel line before the truck starts dying. I ran out of fuel, just as I got to the fuel line. It wasn't until I was fueling up, that it occurred to me what the hell happened at my last stop. This is my final tale though. One night in Arizona, a woman was begging for money, which isn't uncommon at truck stops. She gave the whole sob story about her boyfriend leaving her, she didn't have a job, and lost the apartment. Her two kids were hungry, and she didn't know what to do. With me being a social creature, I let the conversation go on for some reason. To make it short, she was molested by her father as a child raped on several occasions in her teen years, and then found a lesser of an evil boyfriend who tried to get her into drugs, got her pregnant and beat her all the time. I hear that kind of stuff frequently, but just in case she was telling the truth, I gave her what I had in my pockets, which ended up being around $40. She broke down and cried right there, and I started to wonder that perhaps she was telling the truth. She walked away after some more small talk, and I go inside to get dinner, and unbelievably, I see her with her two kids, that look as sad as can be, ordering dinner. They all looked depressed. I knew at that moment that she wasn't lying about a thing she told me, and I felt a lot of remorse for not doing more. 
so I told the waitress to put their meals on my tab. The look on her face when the waitress said that their meal was being paid for by someone else was a look I shall never forget. I am not a trucker, but a dispatcher. However, this story is about a trucker. We had a driver who had, shall we say, an odour problem. I'm not talking like body odour sweat. I'm talking about stale urine. Any time he'd come to the dispatch office, it was a race to get him to leave again. The kind of putrid tang that would make you gag immediately and completely involuntarily, regardless of your best efforts. Driver was a rather heavy set guy, nice enough, but a little slow. We let it go until we started getting complaints from customers about the smell. Now this driver was a flatbed driver, meaning most of his deliveries were onto construction sites, job sites, steel and lumber mills. 90% of deliveries were outdoors. And in the company of rough and tough dudes, who otherwise wouldn't give a damn what you smelt like, we'd still get a couple of phone calls a week from different foremen saying that they wouldn't take this guy onto their site anymore because the odours were so terrible and severely affected his workers. We started delicately attempting to bring it up, trying to urge proper hygiene, etc. He claimed that he showered every day or every other day at worst and that it was just what he smelt like and has always had the problem for as long as he could remember. Nothing he could do. Okay, now here is where things get interesting. At some point, he had to bring his truck in for maintenance. It was a company truck. He did not own it. But we didn't rotate trucks, so he'd had the same one for months. Something had to be checked in the gear shift, so the mechanic had to go inside the truck. Upon climbing into the cab, the mechanic promptly did a 180 and puked out the driver's side door. It was then that the big piss bucket was discovered. I'm not talking like a Gatorade bottle or something like that. I'm talking like a job site shop bucket filled nearly to the top with urine. The floor was wet around it, indicating that some had splashed out. I'm told that the inside of the cabin smelled 10 times worse than he did. It was basically pure concentrated evil. And the walls of the cabin had a slight yellow brown dull sheen. We fired the driver using the complaints from customers as the excuse and then parked the truck outside in our yard. Doors and windows were opened for a week just to try and dull the smell. Then had a guy with a ghetto piece together hazmat type suit, rubber gloves, rubber boots, mask, rain slicker, etc. Go in and basically douse the whole thing in bleach. No matter what they did, no matter how hard they cleaned it, they could not get rid of the smell. That truck sat outside in our yard for a full year windows and doors standing wide open. Rain, snow, blustery winds, it just sat wide open to the elements. One day, a year later, the boss decided to close it up and see how it was. Just as bad as the day they tried to clean it was the answer. He decided to scrap the truck one week later. About 17 years ago, my dad was a baitfish hauler who made runs from Arkansas to the Northeast and Midwest. At one point, whilst he was in Ohio, traffic came to a dead halt. Accident right up ahead of him. A car had been barreling down the highway and drove right underneath a truck and hit the dot bar. Dad noticed the smoke 
and figured it meant a fire was starting up. So he jumped out and ran up to the back of the truck, where a bunch of other truckers and some drivers were. An engine fire was indeed starting, and there were two kids in the back seat of the car, really disoriented from the impact. The back passenger window was too small in the car for them to smash it open and get the kids out, so they had to go through the front passenger window. Dad was the only one with a small enough frame of the group and willing enough to climb inside. So he did. Unfortunately, the driver was too stupid and hadn't been wearing a seatbelt. He'd been decapitated and his body was laying over the passenger seat. So my dad had to climb over him between the two front seats and pull two kids who were basically dead weight. He managed to do so. The car was mostly engulfed in flames about 15 minutes later. They handed the kids off to an elderly couple who took them back to their car and cleaned the blood off them and gave them some sandwiches that they'd packed. State troopers were there a while later, took statements and all of that from everyone. The state boys went back and checked on the kids. They were mostly fine, just a little shaken up. The oldest one was a little girl, and dad had to chuckle at one point when the little girl said, Mama's going to be real mad at daddy this time. Made him wonder what other bonehead moves this dude had done in the past. I remember when dad came home after the run, he had a styrofoam ice chest with him that had his clothes in ice water. Those clothes had been absolutely drenched in blood. Luckily, all came out in the wash, which was good with him, because it was his favourite pair of jeans. My dad was in Albuquerque. He stopped for the night at a pawn shop parking lot. It was around 10.30pm, and his air compressor was empty. Earlier that night, he had rolled down the windows, but since the compressor was out, he couldn't roll back up until it refilled. Anyway, he's getting ready for bed, and a voice yells at him not to move. A female Puerto Rican tweaker jumped into the truck from the driver's side. The voice was on the passenger side window, and pressed a gun to his head, ordering him to give her all his money and belongings of value. Unfortunately for her, my dad doesn't ever carry cash on him, and the poor guy never buys himself anything expensive. He had about $60, a broken laptop, a cup of change, and his clothes, blankets, and toiletries. Of course, he did have his credit card and debit card. They held him hostage there for more than an hour, as she unloaded everything from the cab and handed it to her 300 pound male friend. According to my dad, homegirl was tripping balls the entire time. She ordered him to follow her to the ATM, but considering that my dad owns his own business, it probably wouldn't have ended well when she'd have seen his accounts. He decided he couldn't let it happen. After a few more minutes, she decided that they were walking to the ATM. She had her friend on the passenger side help her down, ordering my dad to follow. As soon as she was clear of the door, he closed the door, locked it, and tried to honk the horn, but it hardly made an audible noise. Apparently, this was enough to send the trio running into the darkness with blankets in hand. Shaken, my dad called the police. Surprisingly, they had an amazing response. 15 to 20 patrol cars, a helicopter, dogs, etc., were there within five minutes. Two of them were caught, but not the third one. For the last seven years, I've been a bull hauler. I've seen some messed up stuff having to do with cattle. But the scariest thing to ever happen to me was on a trip to East Texas. I had left out from around Austin and went up to just north of Amarillo to kick them off at a feedlot. 
around 600 mile trip. I was feeling pretty good, so I decided to turn around and come on back to the cattle company instead of taking my break. I called dispatch and he gave me a sale barn to go pick up and bring back to the company. When I got back I was pretty wore out, but they told me that a truck had broken down heading to Texarkana and he needed me to go and get the cattle. I thought sure I can do this. I made it about an hour from Texarkana, on a little two lane Texas back road, talking to a friend of mine on the phone to try and stay awake, when I fell asleep. I remember hearing my friend yelling my name and waking up just to find myself off in the grass with a cow bite on a horse right in front of me roping a calf. He roped, dialed off and turned to face me and just as I hit him he disappeared. It was a hallucination. Scared me so bad I was wide awake for the rest of the trip. I used to think being outlaw was me being a badass. I would run 1,500 to 2,000 miles with no sleep and just call it another day at work. I now realise it was just me being stupid and putting myself and innocent people in danger. Not something I will ever do again. My father and his friends are truckers and here are some stories that they've shared with me. This one is about how my father lost his job. He worked for an owner operator that had three trucks, one for himself, one for his brother and one for my dad. Well, Larry was out on a run and from what I understand it was somewhere in the south. Anyway, Larry was stopped at a stoplight, the light turns green and he starts to pull through the intersection. Some guys coming the opposite way blow through the stoplight, T-boning Larry's truck. The car went straight under the trailer, crushing the driver and killing him instantly. That's a pretty horrifying thing to witness, right? Larry struggled with PTSD after that, but here's the worst part of the story. The guy that died was married with kids. The family brought suit against Larry and the court ruled that since he was a professional driver, he should have seen the guy about to run the red light and stopped thus preventing the accident. Never mind the fact the guy was driving way above the speed limit, something like 60 miles per hour in a 35 mile zone, and was nowhere in sight when the light changed and Larry started to move forward. Larry ended up selling two of his three trucks to pay for the damages from the suit and to bring a countersuit to court. The truck that Larry kept was given to his brother because he didn't want to drive anymore after that. No idea what happened to the countersuit sadly. Dad kept in touch with Larry for a little while after that, but Larry felt really bad about needing to sell my dad's truck and the whole accident in general. So my dad just kind of left him alone and eventually lost contact. But I hope he got the justice he deserved. The second story actually happened to a close friend of mine called Paul. Paul was driving down a mountainside in West Virginia, when some car speeds up behind him and passes. Well, the car missed a bend in the road and hit the guardrail. Paul stops his truck, gets out and sees if anyone is hurt. He walks up to the car and apparently everyone seems fine because they're A massively drunk and B busy throwing empty beer cans and cases of beer over the guardrail so the police don't find them. Except one guy, who was bleeding from a facial wound. But he was throwing beer cans as fast as everyone else could so Paul let him be. Paul sticks around until the cops show up. He doesn't say too much about the drunk guys, but when the police arrive, he makes sure to point out the guy with the facial wound, which gets a laugh out of the officers. This guy had been sitting in the back seat of the car when it hit the guardrail. Apparently he lurched forward in the collision and slammed his face into the beer he was holding, which cut a perfect outline of the top of the can, pop tab and all, onto his forehead. Around 2007, 
I was a trucker, and it was around 2.30 in the morning in Georgia. I was in the sticks about a hundred miles north of Atlanta, on an I-75, and I was alone in a drop yard for trailers. I was there to drop off my current trailer and hook another one. All I had to do was go to pick up my paperwork from the mailbox and go. I loved shit like this. No bullshit, load is ready for me to pick up, and no waiting around. Great. Now, my entire life, there has been this weird phenomenon that has followed me. You know those halogen street lights. I would say about 60 to 70% of those lights I walked under would go dark. It's the strangest thing. If I walk down a street at night, it's not strange at all if every light I walk under goes out. And when I walk away from it, it comes back on. I walk the streets in darkness. I have no idea why it happens. Anyway, I've dropped my first trailer, backed under the trailer, and picking up, got my paperwork, and I'm raising the landing gear. I'm standing under a big street light, and guess what? It goes out. No big deal. But I say out loud, to no one in particular, I wonder why that always happens. And at that point, the craziest thing that has ever happened to me in my entire life happened. A calm voice from about three feet away said, show of respect. A voice. No one was around for miles. I was out in the middle of nowhere, and there was no one. I heard it plain as day. It was a man's voice. It wasn't loud, scary, nor intimidating. It spoke, very matter-of-factly. Show of respect. I freaked out, jumped into the truck, and moved 80,000 pounds faster than I ever thought I could move it. I'm not crazy. I have never had a mental illness, and there is no history of mental illness in my family. I just wish I knew what it meant. I spent the past 10 years as a truck driver, so I've had my fair share of stories. Coming out of Washington State Terminal, I was asked to take one of our drivers to Southern California. Not a big deal. I've done it before. But let's meet our friend Gibson. You see, Gibson here seemed like a normal, cheerful, and delightful person to keep in company whilst talking your ear off. However, this all changed once the sun went down. Gibson here turns to me and says, Hey, can you pull over for a sec? I need to ward off the snake people. This is where my brain doesn't quite process this, and I say, What? He repeats the same line, and here's where my spidey sense tells me that if Gibson doesn't ward off his snake people, I'm gonna have a bigger problem than this guy's cookie getting flipped. So I pull over and he gets out. Now here comes the weird. He does this dance in front of my headlights, and all I can say is that he certainly does his snake warding dance. Now here's my dilemma. This guy obviously has a few fries short of a Happy Meal, but I was asked to drive his ass to SoCal. Unfortunately, I think too long about this, and Gibson is sitting next to me again in the passenger seat, as if nothing had happened. I drive 1,200 miles without stopping, and Gibson gets his new truck in SoCal and I never give another person I don't know a lift again. But hey, at least I didn't have to deal with the snake people, right? This one happened mostly to my wife, but I was involved. We met for dinner after work and we were heading home. At the time, she had a small car and I was in my massive truck. She was far enough ahead of me for me to make her car look like a dot in the horizon. And then she calls me sounding scared, and says that some guy in one of those smaller Japanese SUVs looks angry and keeps motioning for her to pull over. Now, there was almost no traffic, 
and we'd been on the road for a while, so it's not like she had an opportunity to cut him off. Anyway, while she's on the phone, he even swerves at her a bit, trying to force her off the road. I told her to hold on, and slow down if she could manage it. I stood on the gas, hoping the truck wouldn't blow up. Unfortunately, it didn't. It wheezed, rattled and vibrated up to speed that was most definitely not safe. As I closed the gap, the guy got more and more aggressive. And when I got there, she dove into the emergency lane and stood in her brakes as I bore down on him like an express train. Action almost always beats reaction, and this time was no different. I got between them. He pulled into the other lane as if to let me pass, and I got right onto his bumper, flashing lights and honking, which was probably not the smartest move I could have made, since any braking on his part would have been bad, but at the time I was beyond caring. All of a sudden, Road Rage McDouchebag realises he's about to become the recipient of a steel enema, if he doesn't mend his ways, and he took off. My wife caught up, and we took the next exit. She was shaking up a bit, but otherwise okay. We called the police with his plate number, but unfortunately, nothing ever came of it. This happened to me when I was 15. My dad ran a wrecker service for over-the-road truckers. Late one night, we got a call that a truck had run off the road and struck a tree 20 miles south of town. So my father and I fired up the wrecker and headed south. When we came to the scene, the truck and trailer had ran off the road to the right and smacked a tree head on. It was one of those 100 year old oak trees. This was back in the day when there were cab over semi trucks, all the ones without noses or the engine is underneath the cab. The truck was still running at idle. The doors were closed, but no driver was seen in the driver's window. The front driver's windshield was busted and there was a large hole in the middle. The trailer was loaded with flat quarter inch steel sheets. Of course, it's pitch black and you can't really see things that well. When we first got there, our impression was that the driver smacked the tree, hit his head on the windshield, and was already getting treatment somewhere else. So my dad set up the wrecker to hook onto the trailer, and he wanted me to open the cab up in order to release the brakes. When I opened the door, I was greeted with a lower half of a body. When the driver hit the tree, a single sheet of steel broke free and cut through the cab, cutting the driver in half. The upper half of his body went through the windshield. I found the driver's upper half in a cornfield, about 40 feet from the truck, and he was still grabbing the upper part of the steering wheel. It looked like he was frozen in time, still driving the truck. Needless to say, he went into a body bag with his lower half, and we worked through the night, getting the truck and trailer back to town. This is one of many experiences I've had growing up in a wrecker service family. Many years ago, I was on what was called a meet and turn. This is where a driver that is domiciled out of one city will drive a load halfway to its destination, whilst a driver, domiciled out of that destination, will drive halfway with a load that is destined for my city. We met in a parking lot, switch trailers, and drive back home. I had been on this run for a few months, and found that I always got to the meet point about an hour before the other driver. It was a dark and empty dirt lot around 3am, so I would stretch across the seat and take a short nap. One night, about 10 minutes into my nap, I was awoken by a barking dog. I tried to ignore it, but it carried on for several minutes and got louder as the dog got closer. 
Soon, it became apparent that the dog was right outside my truck, barking at me. Okay, either this dog is lassie and trying to alert me of something, or else it's just a pain in the ass and I'll need to throw something at him to scare him off. It's important to note, the barking had been going on for a good 10 minutes at this point. So I sat up and looked out my window, standing there, mere inches on the other side of the glass, was a man about 35. He was a large fellow, and was barking at me. His eyes were crazy, and he was frothing from the mouth a little. The scene really held my attention for a moment. The sheer creepiness of this struck me, gently, and making an absolute minimum of sudden movement. I reached down and started my truck, and slowly pulled away. He chased me, much like you'd expect an angry dog to do, barking all the while. Needless to say, it played hell with my power naps from then on. I've been a long haul truck driver for a few years, and just spending every day out on the road is pretty crazy. You see a lot through the windshield of a truck. The image that sticks out with me the most are the dead people that you see. There was a bad incident one night in Chicago. It was late, rainy, on the interstate by Wrigley Field, and all I could see were flashing lights in the opposite lane. I don't usually rub a neck because I don't want to see other people's misfortune. But this time I did. There was a dead family lying broken on the road. And the first responders were pretty much just standing around, waiting for the coroner to arrive. I can still see the flashing lights in the rain, and the little dead baby lying 30 feet away from its dead parents. I wish I had never looked. Another time again near Chicago, probably around Gary, I saw a possible drunk driver in a fancy car, driving erratically on the interstate. I called the police, and gave them the mile marker where it was, so that they could try and stop it. I lost sight of the car as it sped off, but a few miles down the road, it was flipped over, on the other side of the freeway engulfed in flames. I don't think the driver made it out, as there was no one standing beside it. One night in northern Ontario, I was climbing a hill, on a single lane back up top, and just as I crest the hill, there is a minivan coming straight at me in my lane, and a long line of cars that are passing the other. I have nowhere to go, and I'm not allowed to leave my lane of traffic even if that means killing you. So I hit the brakes, even managing to lean forward and grab the trailer spike to use all the brakes, knowing these two things. I'm about to kill someone in this minivan, and that I'm about to be covered in thousands of gallons of horse piss that I was hauling in the trailer. Luckily, the stupid minivan was able to get back on the other lane when other vehicles started hitting their brakes to avoid the incident that was about to happen. Things like this I remember nearly dying in accidents, nearly killing people as they cut you off, not realising how long it takes for a truck to stop. There are good days to driving trucks, but the bad ones are the reasons I quit. I was running on Kansas Highway 96, out of the Great Bend early one morning. Dawn was just peeking over the horizon back to the east, and I rounded the curve out of the town, Heading west, when I see Bambi and the gang crossing the road, it must have been at least 12 of them. I get up in the middle of the road and I lay on the air horn. They stop crossing, but they all start running along both sides of the road in the direction I'm going. I get back on the throttle, and just as I come up on the group, I see two of the deer on the north side, deciding that they now want to join the group on the south side. Reflexes kicked in 
and I jump into the oncoming lane to avoid them. I saw one's face as clear as day, as my fender and the door went past him. He didn't hit the corner door of my trailer or my drives, luckily. However, he did hit his head on the side of my trailer. It must have been enough to daze him as I watch him fall and get hit by my back hopper on the side. He went under my trailer tandems when he exploded. I was gross overweight, so he didn't stand a chance. I pulled over about a mile up the road where it was wide enough to do so, and went to look over my trail. I didn't see any marks on my trailer or hopper, nor anything much of the trailer tandems. The only thing was left was a tuft of fur or two, and blood dripping on both mud flaps. I was driving a shortcut from 29 Pines to Albuquerque. 29 Pines is located in the desolate highway east of LA. The shortcut was all two lame roads through the total nothingness, except passing through Amboy, California. Amboy is a nearly abandoned town, nearly as far below sea level as Death Valley with a dormant volcano and lava field on one side, and a salt flat on the other. It was also at the time, a hot spot for satanic group activity. So I was driving by myself in the afternoon, and I stopped in Amboy and snapped a picture of the city sign, just to prove to my friends who dared me to take a picture when I got to Route I-40. I got back in my truck, and proceeded to drive up the mountain range between Amboy and I-40. Once I reach the top, I am driving north through a canyon with high grass on both sides of the road. Up ahead, I see some stuff in the middle of the road. As I approach, I slow down to see a red Pontac Fiero stop sideways across both lanes, a suitcase open with clothes scattered everywhere, and two bodies laying face down in the road a man and a woman. I stop a hundred feet or so away, and the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. Being a marine, I reach under the seat and pull out a 9mm pistol and chamber around. Something seemed very wrong. It looked too perfect, as if it was staged. An ambush? Was I being paranoid? Something was just wrong. Getting out seemed unthinkable. It was the horror movie move. I scanned the road and saw that I might just be able to get by. So I drove the line I planned. I passed the back of the Fiera without hitting it or either bodies on the road. And I continued forward a couple of hundred feet and slowed down so that I could breathe and let my heart slow down. I decided at that moment to look back and the two bodies had gotten up on their knees and twenty or so people emerged from the tall grass on either side of the road. At that moment, my right foot smashed the gas pedal to the floor, and I didn't let up for a long time. I would never know what would have happened to me if I'd have gotten out to check, or stopped my vehicle closer to them. Somehow, I don't think it would have been good. And sometimes, real life can be scarier than any movie. My dad had been a truck driver my whole life. The one incident that sticks out to me the most is when he saw someone in this company accidentally kill a lady. Or rather, the lady was killed by the guy's truck. There was this notoriously bad intersection, and the woman just blew through it illegally and out in front of my dad's co-worker's loaded semi, with my dad directly behind him. A lot of people don't realise that trucks can't slow down like cars. They have to gear down, because of how heavy they are. She was killed instantly, and her family later tried to sue the company my dad worked for, which went nowhere. Also, when I was a kid, he was in a grain elevator explosion. My dad's truck was about the tenth in line, and the first couple of trucks were basically vaporised. 
it was a pretty scary day, because we saw about it on the news before he was able to get hold of us. I worked as a trucker for a year or so, and had some weird experiences. One of the strangest things I saw was off the Trans Canada in BC. It was surprisingly dead on the road I was on, with nobody going in either direction, which is weird even for Wednesday in the wee hours of the morning. I found a corner and see a pillar of smoke. My initial thought was, that explains the no traffic, and I start to slow down since it's kind of a blind corner, and I see that there's only one car off in a ditch, fire blazing. I pull off the road to see if anyone is injured as I can't see anyone, and on the other side, the clearing is, no joke, four or five black bears standing on their back legs. As I notice them, they all begin roaring like crazy, like I intruded on some sort of party or something. I back away back into my truck and watch them as they calmly continue to watch the fire. I don't even know what happened that morning, and I will never know. Bears are weird. My uncle was a truck driver for many years. He doesn't share a lot of stories, but he told me this one night, whilst we were drinking beer. He spent several years doing cross-country trips, often loading up his trailer in the middle of the night. While he waited for his trailer to be loaded, he'd make his way over to a nearby truck stop, have a late night meal, and shoot the shit with any other drivers there. After a while, he would make friends with drivers that were on a somewhat similar schedule. He befriended this particular guy that he would run into about once a month or so. He said this guy was massive, a huge guy. My uncle is kind of a wise ass that can get annoying really quickly. He said this was one guy he knew that when he crossed the line and agitated him, it was time to go. Anyway, he runs into this guy every so often, and they shoot the shit and kill time, while their semi-trucks are getting loaded up. One night, the guy invites him back into his semi. He wants to show him something that he built there in his semi. This guy's semi has a sleeper on the back, so it's pretty big. Basically, it's a semi-truck with a small room right behind the driver to sleep in. My uncle is intrigued by seeing what kind of custom work this guy has done in his semi, so he goes along with him. Once there, in the truck, the guy shows him what he's built in the sleeper of his semi. It's a big, heavy-duty box. Apparently, it has hydraulic arms on either side, so he can open and close it with the push of a button. He says that once he's pushed the button, it's sealed shut and can no longer be opened. My uncle is kind of weirded out by this, but cracks a few jokes about the box. The guy then starts to get a little bit agitated, and my uncle realised this and decided it's time to leave this guy semi. A few months later, he found out that this guy was a serial killer, stuffing truck stop hookers and others into this custom hydraulic box. At this point in the story, his hand starts shaking and he can barely drink his beer. That guy was massive, he says. His hand could cover most of my head. He could have stuffed me in that box and there was nothing I could have done to stop him. Or oh, shit, maybe someone was in there already. He said he still had nightmares about it years later, and after some research, I suspect it was the notorious serial killer, Keith 
Jesperson. My mother is a trucker, and this is her story. She was driving through Arizona when she saw what she thought were leaves blowing across the road in the distance. This puzzled her, since there's mostly pine trees in northern Arizona. When she finally got to the leaves, she realized that they were migrating tarantulas. Thousands of them. There were so many of them that her truck was sliding on their guts, so she had to slow down. She stopped at the first truck stop and told her co-driver to fuel up as he was sleeping at the time, because she was not going to Stepford outside after what she'd just seen. Her co-driver was pissed, since it was technically his time off, and he thought she was going crazy, until he saw the tarantula guts and legs caked in the inside wheel of the truck. She also outran a tornado in the Midwest. She was about to pull over and take cover until she saw another big rig that was parked on the side of the road get tossed a couple of hundred yards away like a toy. She called me and told me that she thought she was going to die and wanted her last words to be I love you to me. She pulled off the freeway and got to a Walmart where she ran into the basement where all the staff and customers were taking shelter. After the tornado passed, they stepped out of the basement into daylight, since the Walmart was destroyed. My dad drives in Texas a lot, but there is a particular road he always avoids. I'm not sure which road it is, but he says it's in the middle of old Native American land. On a cloudless night, he was driving through. He kept seeing shadows run along the side of his trailer. Every once in a while, he would hear a loud bang, as if someone was slapping the side of the trailer. After a while, he was getting tired of it. It could have possibly been something that demanded his attention. So he decided to stop, and see if perhaps a tire had blown because that was probably the most likely thing that could be making the noise. He opened the door and stepped out. He did his usual walk around, checking the tires. But as he turned the corner, he heard a laugh and a shadow took off running down the road. Needless to say, he shit his pants and jumped into the truck he was driving like a maniac, and about 15 miles later, he saw the skinwalker standing on the side of the road with its arms crossed. He didn't stop until daylight. My dad was a trucker for years before a work injury grounded him. He came home white as a sheep one day and wouldn't talk for two days. When he did, he told us that a lady had ran a red light and tried to speed underneath his trailer. This was shortly after the Fast and Furious movie came out, and the resulting wreck turned the car into a convertible and decapitated the woman. The side of his trailer was a raw shack of blood and grey matter, and it took my dad two months of therapy to get back in his rig and even though the insurance company said it was fixable, he scrapped the trailer and started pulling trailers for a big company instead of his own. I just wish that some people would be more careful on the road. My uncle was a long haul truck driver back in the 90s, mainly did international runs from Canada down to the US and then back to Canada. He had a pretty nice new Kemworth that had one of those maximum size sleepers on it, a built-in toilet and the works. He decided that the small tank that came with the toilet was a pain in the ass to have to empty so frequently. So he converted half of his passenger side diesel tank into a septic tank. 
a few weeks after converting his tank, he happened to pull into a truck stop somewhere in the United States and parked for the night after driving longer than he should have. He woke up at 5am with the dawn just starting to get bright. He climbed out to see besides his truck, something that would make him laugh every time he tells this story. On the ground on the right hand side of the truck was a five gallon jerry can, a siphon hose with one end in his tank and the other laying on the ground. Puddle of puke and some puke footprints, another few feet away, puddle of puke, another few feet away, another pile of puke. Some dumb son of a bitch tried to siphon his septic tank in the middle of the night. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I've been hearing what you guys have been requesting in the comments section. Which is why tomorrow, I've got a big paranormal video lined up for you. With some all new, never before heard stories. It's gonna be big and not to be missed. It would mean the world to me if you would show this video a little love by leaving a like and dropping a comment as it goes a long way. And why not consider sharing the video with a friend or someone who you think will enjoy it. Just a reminder that you can see my new merchandise which can be found in the description along with the links to my social media as well as my Patreon if you are feeling extra generous. If you would like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email or share it to my Reddit, which is of course in the description. Please make sure to include as much punctuation and descriptive language as possible to maximize your chances of it being read. But anyway, for now guys, I'm gonna sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.